Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday, so that means I'm going to be joined by Tim Miller. But here's the thing. We actually spoke last night at our special live show in New York City, and it was a fantastic show, long in the making, and it was really great getting to meet so many Bulwark fans. We have other live shows planned around the country, and if you'd like to attend, join the Bulwark, join Bulwark Plus, find out when we're coming to a city near you. And with that, let's go to last night's live show where I put my buddy Tim to the test. It's Thursday, and we are in New York City, Tim Miller. We're in New York City, baby! Yeah. Yeah. I love and it. I'm glad you dressed for the occasion. You got the Denver hat. I got my Nuggets hat on. The, the game's after, yeah, straight after this. Thing. Go Nuggets! Right. Game's after this. I'm going to do some selfies, and you know, don't get mad at me if I'm looking at my phone during the selfies. Yeah, okay, I am now, monitoring the Nuggets game. I have been asked whether something we do on the podcast occasionally is just shtick or whether it is real. Okay. 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 So I don't um, like Donald I, Trump. I, I wanted to play this off. This New York audience, please do not shout out your answers until I ask you. Oh no, Tim Miller, one of the great show tunes of all time. Number one. I'm such a bad gay. Right side lights winking and winking. Ain't no finer rig. I'm a thinking you can keep. All right, Tim Miller, name, name that musical. I was worried you were going to do this, so I Googled famous musicals yes. on the subway. Yeah. It wasn't helpful. Is this Mary Poppins? All right. Okay. New York. Everyone in what New York it? City I still, knows I don't it know. is what did they say? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Okay. Mm. Better chance you might get this one, okay. but there's a bonus question, too. Play number two. I could have done. This sounds familiar. Okay. Okay. All right, Tim Miller. No. Les Miserables. Uh, New York, please. Okay. Bonus points. What was it? Who was that? Oh, I see. Okay. What was that from? This is My Fair Lady, but that is the uh. Broadway version, and that is sung by Julie Andrews. Huh. This is this is this is a hint for you, Tim. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Name that musical. Doe, a deer, female deer. You really like this? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is horrible. Me, you a name, I call okay. myself. Right. You know this song. You sang this as a child. As a child, yeah. yeah. And I have no, I, I have no fucking New idea. New York City. The Sound of Music, Julie Andrews, I re- once, I don't. once again. That, that, oh, okay. So the Doe a Deer song is from Sound of Music? Well, I, re- I Really? I didn't... It, that's, it is in there. That's, that's a good fact. W- wait till you fact. hear, what do you do with a problem like if, Maria? If it wasn't for the Nuggets, I'd be at Marie's Crisis later, and I would uh, know the song. So. Okay. I do have an easy one coming. I have a, I have a, a layup for you, but okay. let's go with number four. Okay. How many of these that are musical? there? There were birds on the hill. See? Mm-hmm. He's gonna get it. Is that gonna not get also it. the sound of music? <sighs> oh, I never <sighs> them at all. I New York. The Music Man. Never this heard of the, that. This is the Music Man. All right. I am pretty sure I've actually bet a great deal of money with my producer, Katie Cooper, that you will get this one. Okay. Okay. All right. So, okay. So let's play this one. This is this is this is the this is the, 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 the layup for Mr. Miller. Yeah. In that musical. Oh no. No, no. Kids. This is Donald Trump's favorite song. He's playing this in Mar a Lago right now. There's ketchup all over the wall, but this is. Playing. I didn't know there were going to be five of these. I only came, I only Googled three oh, musical all names. All right. New York. Cats. Cats. Oh. All right. I'm I got sorry. high and watched Cats. All right. I heard we had one more, actually. No? Is there one more? I heard I heard. I think that. T- Tim had one. I heard I think, that. I heard that. Oh, I, okay. I heard there was maybe one more. Six. New York City comps. New York City comps. New York City comps. They ain't too smart. No, you didn't say it. I, I, I apologize yeah, if there's anybody who backs the blue in the room for that choice. Sorry, you got me there. You don't know it? No idea. The, no. The, no. The number one New York indie band right there. That was them from I'm the Im- 2000s. Anyone have it? I am impressed. This Only oh, three people have it. 
The Strokes. I think this is my audience here. <laughs> I think it's the music. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So since it is a New York audience, Rudy. <laughs> what? Can you explain what happened to this man? Now, I have a theory. I just wanted to bounce this off. Got a glass of whiskey. America's. Honor. I mean, it, it is all the planets aligning of the narcissism, the arrogance, the extremism, but I am Viagra. convinced that medical science is going to discover that there is such a thing as Viagra bourbon poisoning <laughs> that does something to your brain. Can you explain this story to me? Rudy's poor daughter. You know, and have to read that. You know, have to hear about your dad. I, 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 I think I, it's been I don't hard know. before I don't think this. that it's, I mean, I, there could be alcoholism and everything, and I'm interested in our New York expert, Molly Jong's fast yeah. uh, psychological takes on Rudy in the next hour. But honestly, it's so strange to think this, but he has this grievance. Like, I feel like he feels like it should be Rudy Giuliani train station instead of Moynihan train station. And then well, he feels like he, everyone he should have respect been. him. It could have been, right? There could have been a school, every airport in America would be named Rudy I mean, but look now. But he just wanted the buzz so badly. And I think the big giveaway on this is the Bill Clinton element of the whole thing. Like the fact that he asked this young woman to give him a blowy while he was on a work call so that he could feel like Bill Clinton. Well, and when they were in bed and having sex, he insisted that she call him Mr. President. <laughs> so I, I, mean, that's, I, that's I think better, the, that's better than Rudy Slut. Yeah, okay. it's a little it's a little less gross for me than Rudy I don't know slut. where this lawsuit is going to go, but I am really intrigued. And I talked about this on our Trump trials podcast with Ben Wittes from Lawfare, which is our Thursday podcast. Um, yeah, just really quick, by the way, no kink shaming, nothing wrong with Viagra. No, 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 no. You I'm, know, I'm, whatever you want to call your husband or wife in bed tonight after a few drinks with the bulwark, you guys do that. That's okay. fine. Let's just say that if you're taking more than 10 a day... <laughs> You might want to talk to somebody because you might. And if you mix it with alcohol, yeah, you become Rudy Giuliani. I, I think it's Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, just they, actually. But I do think it's interesting to know where this case goes in terms of the selling of the pardons, because leaving apart mm -hmm. the salacious stuff, which I could spend all night on, the so fact that, that, he's, that he's talking about selling pardons, which you can't do unless you have the person who gives out the pardons being involved. So I do wonder whether there's going to be an investigation of fallout from that. Well, the time was, was on this, actually. There was a Time story in late 2021 yeah. that had a different source saying that Rudy was going around town saying that he could get pardons for $2 million. So this lawsuit, which a lot of the anecdotes in there check out. I mean, Rudy, it's not right. like this is the first Their person takes. to say Rudy's been drinking at 10 a.m. So the question, I think, comes down to whether, like, was Rudy really... Selling pardons for $2 million, or was he just like talking a big game, just like he wanted to have the gal call him Mr. President? Like he wanted to feel important. Well, and, and then and I that's, think that, and that's that, his that, defense, that's the right? Question. I mean, right. that's the defense is insanity, and you might actually be able to pull that off. Okay, so uh, breaking news today about the presidential campaign um, Disney apparently was not bluffing. Um, and they basically. They, they basically sent a postcard to Ron DeSantis, you know, blanker, you know, just. I, I can't say these words here. On, on, Just on, say on, 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 guys, you know, And find out. And they've canceled now a multi-billion dollar office project in Orlando the week mm. that Ron DeSantis was hoping to roll out his presidential campaign. I mean, I'm working on my headline for morning shots tomorrow, and I'm thinking of Disney's dagger right now. What do you oh. think? Yeah. I thought you were going with Daddy there. Um, no. uh, this is their daddy. Um, the big winner of all this is the people who work for Disney Parks yeah. who no longer have to move to Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> oh. get to stay in LA. Oh. So congratulations to them. Mm. And, and I accept leaks from any Disney employees that are out there as well. Um, DeSantis, like, I never thought that I'd end up being such a Bob Iger stan. You know, yeah. I'm not really into um, just getting all uh, the, the hagiography of the corporate titans. You know, it's not really my style. But uh, Bob Iger has really dominated him on this. And yeah. it's just what a horrific mistake. And I think that when you look at, I got into a little Twitter dispute with a National Review writer today about like why DeSantis's poll numbers are going down, right? And his point was, yeah. you could attribute it to anything, right? Because like his poll numbers have gone down 20 points. And he's like, I think it's because of brag, but it could be anything. The Disney thing to me like, really stands out as being a contributing factor, not the factor, because yeah. it's like, 
the voters want the alpha, right? Yeah. The voters want somebody you can fight. And he has been just bitched out so hard by yeah. them on this. Right. And it's been so blatant. Uh, like he thought that he was going to have an easy foil just here. Just a mouse. Yeah, yeah, he thought he was going to have an easy foil here. Just a little mouse. So, and, and I think that it's really harmed his brand broadly. So have we talked about my lizard theory about the, the, uh, Ron, a, a little bit? That, I read about it. That Ron DeSantis figures, okay, if I need to be the Republican nominee, I have to get the mega votes, I have to become a lizard. I have to look like a lizard mm-hmm. and act like a lizard. So he shows up with his suit and his Yale law degree and goes, hello, fellow lizards. And he acts as if he tries to figure out what would they do. And so he takes the most extreme, blunt, crudest possible position on every issue with no subtlety whatsoever. Right. And he just doesn't have the lizard thing down yet. It's kind of like when Mitt Romney said, I am severely conservative. It's like you scream in authenticity. And frankly, believe it or not, even with the derangement of the Republican Party and the Republican electorate, there are people that remember, wait, weren't we the people who didn't like the idea of government bullying and beating up on a private yeah. company? I mean, it sounds a little fascist-y. It does. Yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. And it's also dizzy. Like, you forget, DeSantis is trying so hard to appeal to the super cons, the super activists, yeah. the people that just mainline Matt Walsh and, and, ben, right. and ben Shapiro. And, like, you forget that Trump appealed to a lot of people that liked his anti-elite sensibility, yeah. right. liked his culturally conservative sensibility, but don't follow every yeah. little Right. Uh, scandal. Like, they're still drinking Bud Light, right? You know, right. I mean, Bud Light sales might have gone down, but they haven't gone down that yeah. much, right? There are people out there that are still drinking Bud Light. This isn't the biggest deal in the world. And if you jump on every one of these things, you start to come off as weird. This happened to Ted Cruz. Like, I think in this Ted exam- Cruz started off weird. Yeah, well, he, he, I mean, he didn't have far to go. Right, right. No, they, they both are really yeah. weird, but they start like, to show. Hey, who is shocked to find out that Ted Cruz is the biggest asshole in the world? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, but, you know, but, the, but this kind of person, like you have in your mind's eye, like the barstool sports person, or yeah. or the senior version of that that like listens to talk yeah. radio, yeah. right? And they're like, I don't like these elites. But I don't go to church two times a week, and I don't. I think it's very. I still show. I still watch Disney movies with my grandkids, and I still drink Bud Light. Like I'm not obsessed with all this shit, like you weirdos. And DeSantis is veering into this weirdo category. And I mentioned this yesterday in the next level, but it's worth doing again. Is that I saw this Instagram post from I follow the gays against groomers. I punish myself for you guys, okay? <laughs> and a couple of them are handsome, but that's just a, that's just a side benefit, okay? And I follow them, and one of them was posting yesterday, and they were really upset. And they're like, I think that it's very strange. Did you see the story about the Strange World teacher? The teacher showed Strange World, and now she's under investigation. This is a serious issue, actually. It's not funny. It's fucking crazy. It's like this teacher showed a movie that was relevant to the subject matter of fifth graders. There's no sex in it. And, uh, And the teacher's now under investigation. And the Gays Against Groomer guy is like, Guys, I think we might have gone a little overboard on this. You know, I think that we, I think that, I think 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 we might be. And if that guy who I met at the TPUSA festival is like, you're getting a little weird. Well, that, uh, uh, that's a bad sign for when you get to the normal Orlando kind of crowd. And I think that he's hurting himself. Yeah. I think you have the millions of parents whose kids watch Disney or grew up with Disney. How they react to all of this? How many of them are thinking, well, actually, there probably are a lot thinking, you know, please save me from having to watch Frozen for the <laughs> thousandth time. I mean, yeah. does this resonate with anybody? Okay, this... Have you been to Disney World? I'm telling you, if anybody's had to take their kids or grandkids to Disney World, there's a lot of magus there, okay? And it's not, it's not okay. an effeat uh, uh, Upper West Side, Whole Foods crowd, s- okay, <laughs> on Space Mountain, I promise. Well, I'm glad there's no elitism here. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad we're defending democracy yeah. this way. Um, Real America, ninety. You know what? We should we should have played. It's a small world after all. So, I would have gotten that one. He would not know I would that, have but that it would one. haunt his memories and his dreams forever. Okay, I, I'm I'm sorry to segue to a completely not funny subject because speaking of the the lizardy demagoguery of of, of Ron DeSantis, since we are here in New York, it's particularly relevant. Um, the enthusiastic way that he has felt the need to come to the defense to raise money for the defense fund for the vigilante who choked a man to death in a New York subway. Now, I think there's a lot of ways of of discussing this, but I was really struck by the fact that he describes this man who, and you may think that he's a hero or that he was, you know, stepping up, but to describe him as a good Samaritan, 
seems to suggest seems like that, you, you that, missed, per, missed that the point of the parable. He doesn't really understand the story of the Good, the Good Samaritan, Samaritan because choke somebody the, out. It's been yeah, a while yeah, yeah, since yeah, I've been yeah. in Catholic school. I forget. See, I, okay, I mean, even a New York audience is going to know that in that story, the Good Samaritan did not stop and then choke somebody yeah. to death. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. The Catholics, weren't, we weren't yeah, big yeah. on Bible reading right. okay. in school in the Catholic, uh, Catholicism, but we have the okay. gist so of the story. Let's, let's talk about this because, and I wrote about this uh, this morning, the brutality is the point. There yeah. is this new fetish for extrajudicial killings. They're vying with one another. How can we have more executions? But also, I'm from Wisconsin. Kyle Rittenhouse has become, yeah, you're gay? Really? <laughs> uh, I, never, I, I just have never, I never mentioned that up. yet. Sarah has a focus group? I don't know. <laughs> We keep these things to ourselves. We don't actually say these things. So yeah, I'm from Wisconsin. Yeah. And Kyle Rittenhouse kills two people in, in, in Kenosha, in Mequon, Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah, Kyle Rittenhouse kills two people and has become a MAGA icon. You have a man who shot and killed a Black Lives Matter protester in Texas. The governor of Texas is now saying that he is going to yeah. pardon him. And of course, now we have every Republican candidate for president, the entire right-wing media ecosystem, basically saying this was a good thing that this man was choked to death in the subway. Yeah. Tim Miller. Ugh. Well, there's a lot of places to go there. I mean, for starters, part of this is just this, we're in this tribal, you know, where you project the worst onto the other, like folks aren't willing to come to New York, and I've been on the subway all day in and out today, and I, and I, I know that it's true. I know that big cities everywhere, I just left Oakland, San Francisco, New Orleans has its problems, like crime is an issue places. Like this notion that that the subway is so unsafe and like it's so threatening everywhere that like this needs to happen because the police yeah. are in these democratic right. blue cities are falling down on their job. It's just all based on this fantasy, right? Like Like every place has their issues, I am very, what, you know, supportive of making sure... Crime is a fantasy? Well, it's certainly a fantasy that the subway in New York is so dangerous that you need vigilantes to choke people out. I mean, like, if you look, on the, if you look at the numbers, New York City is safer mm-hmm. than Florida. Mm-hmm. Like, on, on, yeah, a per, yeah. on a percent... Now, could it be safer yet? Sure. Yeah. Could it be safer yet? Sure. Was it safer before the pandemic than it is yeah. now? Yes. Is it safer now than it was during the 1980s? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all relative, right? But so some of this stuff is a, maybe not a fantasy, but a hallucination of you want it to be what it is in your imagination rather than what it is in reality. I, I felt completely safe as a gay man in pearls on the New York subway today. Nobody threatened me. Um, the written house element is, the, is another thing that's worth getting into, though, right? Which is you know, we are now valorizing these people, yeah, right? Awesome. And it would be one thing if, if the guy, you know, you can imagine a hypothetical alternate situation. We don't know all the details, right? Where Jordan Neely was fucked up and uh, maybe getting in front of a woman's face and the guy comes yeah. over and, like, yeah. holds him yeah. and it's like, hey, like, we're going to get off right. the next... You know what I mean? You can imagine right. a situation that would be worth valorizing, right. right? That wasn't this. Like, he killed an unarmed right. person. This is the point. Disorderly conduct, you don't need to tolerate it, but... It's not a death penalty It's not a death penalty, right? You do not administer the death penalty for disorderly conduct. Right. That seems to be a pretty yeah. clear line. Yeah. So... The other thing here, which just shows, and obviously, oh, there's hypocrisy in the building with Republicans. Okay, you get it. But I I think you get into the political vulnerability side of this thing when when a normal people look at Kyle Rittenhouse and you're like, that is bad. It is not good to have a high school kid driving into a city with weapons, right? Like, it's not good to attack someone on the subway and choke them to death. And when you're like, oh, I'm valorizing them... I think that that separates you away from mainstream opinion. And this was the core complaint of Kamala Harris, right? After what was happening, you know, in Kenosha, Mm -hmm. right? When Kamala Harris was paying bail for some of the people that were, you know, uh, criminalized in Wisconsin. That wasn't, that was actually not a smart political move from Kamala Harris, right? Like that was a mistake. Like we cannot be celebrating people that are creating this kind of disorder. And that was a uniform opinion among the Republicans, but now it's like a white person does it on the subway, a white person does it on the streets, and it's like, okay, we can valorize yeah. them. It's not hard to see between the lines. Yeah, this requires a longer discussion, including the failure of the mental health system to deal with Mr. Neely. I mean, the, he was identified. Because Republicans are big on funding mental health well, systems. Well, 
By the way, this is actually an interesting issue because that's yeah. become the go-to thing yeah. about guns, right? Is that every time there's a mass shooting, it's the mental health thing. And fine, let's do that. But it's one governor after another that has slashed funding for mental health, yeah. and, and they don't get called on it. I mean, it is, it is bizarre. Speaking of other strange things that are happening, and we're going to get to Donald Trump in just a moment. But <laughs> Who? Well... And I, and I think, you know, as, because we do talk about it so much, every once in a while there'll, there'll be, you know, somebody will ask a question that implies that we'll win and if he ever leaves the scene, how long does it take for things to go back to normal? And we have some bad news for you on that. Because the dysfunction of the Republican Party uh, was a pre-existing condition that he exacerbated and it will stay afterwards. But there's something also in the culture of, you yeah. know, and, and this goes to what we're talking about, the vigilanteism that if you convince enough people that this kind of behavior is acceptable and is valorized, but also that the world is a really, really scary place, then you have things like young black teenager goes to the wrong house, rings the doorbell, man with a gun shoots and kills him because there are scary people out there, and I am simply defending my castle. And you can see the uptick in the distrust, and what a toxic stew of so many guns, and then convincing people. And I come from a state, as I mentioned, um, where lots of people have guns, but but used to, but used to really emphasize. I and mean, this is the thing I think people need to understand: is that you know, what percentage of gun owners actually believe in gun safety and you know being responsible? But what's happening now? is that they're kind of being shoved aside by the, let's have constitutional carry. Do you know what constitutional carry is? That in the state of Florida, you can carry a concealed weapon, not only without a permit, but without any background check and without any training about how to use the thing. And honestly, it feels like five minutes ago, if you had a room full of gun owners and said, do you think this is a good idea? They would have said that it's nuts completely insane, and yeah. yet here we are. It's a hobby horse. I'm glad you brought this yeah. up. I didn't know this was on our list today. Did you, have you, uh, anybody see the J.J. Reddick rant about John Morant recently? Um, I'm going to do a little, yeah, I'm going to do a little basketball crossover. But it's a cross-cultural issue, right? So John, John Morant is a basketball player for the Memphis Grizzlies, who's going to be suspended because he was flashing a gun on Instagram, yeah. black guy. And J.J. Reddick's on ESPN going, I'm, I, I'm upset that John is going to be punished for this when when there's no equivalent punishment that happens when, right. you know, guys are carrying AR-15s around. And, like, you know, you have the yeah. governor of Texas, you know, we're doing constitutional carry in Florida, yeah. like in Tennessee, where John is, in Memphis. Like, the governor is supporting all this pro-gun stuff, and they're doing the Christmas cards with the guns, which you've written about. Yeah. My issue with his rant was that, like, everyone needs to stop excusing the people on their own sides on this. Yeah. Like, this has gotten completely out of control. It's out of control, yeah. obviously, in conservative environs, but it's out of control, certainly, in city environs among, you know, younger people of color in particular. It's like, it's cool to have a gun. It's not cool to have a handgun. It's not cool to have an AR-15. It's not cool to have a Christmas card with guns in it. It's not... Yeah. It fucking sucks. Like, yeah. it doesn't make you a bigger man to have a fucking hand penis, okay? It just doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. And not enough people are out there saying that, right? Like across the board. And like it it is, it's what we really need to address because as I've written about in many of the situations, it's like when you're in a society where everyone has decided that I should carry, right? And when there's a lot of inter societal tension then there's no laws that are going to fix this, right? I mean, Jared Polis in, my, in Colorado is doing a great job. Like, they've done a lot of, like, really meaningful reforms. But it's, it's like, as long as everybody's carrying around these guns, you know, like, you can only do so much, right? Like, there's a cultural rot here that needs to be addressed, and I feel like that there is a empty set of people that are really willing to call out across the board, like, it's time to reassess this. Obviously, there's nobody on the right that's doing it. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for that. I mean, I, see, you know, as, as you know, if you ever listen to the podcast, I hate talking about these because I'm so frustrated. I, I mean, honestly, uh, th- this whole question of the mass shooting after Newtown just broke me. I mean, just listening to this doom loop of, you know, stupid discussion. And I do keep waiting for the thought lead. You know what the problem with being a thought leader is? You have to think. <laughs> and then you have to lead. And I know that there are, are you people a thought out leader? There, are you um, self-identifying as a thought leader? I, 
I strive to be oh, okay. Got it. I or don't. at least I play one on a podcast. Oh, okay, got it. And so I'm am am waiting. I, I, am, I am waiting for the eighty percent of gun owning normies to be the ones to say that is complete bullshit. That you are, you know, the day after a school shooting, that you have an AR-15 lapel pin. Yeah, fuck you. Okay, uh, yeah. So, all right. Speaking of. Of, of, of the depths of, of crazy out there, because it's very easy, you know, to talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. By the way, so a political party that thinks of Marjorie Taylor Greene as a leader is blank, Ted Noah. <laughs> I mean, doing pretty well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. No, I mean, it, it's just it's so obvious. I mean, it's, it's out of its freaking She's mind. She's the dominant it's, figure. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it, it's an indication when you say, well, what's happened to the Republican Party? Look, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who should not, you know, have any entree to civilization at all, is in this position. But which brings me, Tim, to Elon Musk. Oh, my pal. I'm so happy about this one. I mean, have you been following what the world's richest man has been doing? Because... Sometimes people open their mouths and they expose things. Did you guys watch the CNBC interview with Elon Musk? Mm. That poor guy that had to do the interview, I don't know. I'm not a CNBC watcher. My stock yeah. portfolio you, you, you is not too. that great. Yeah. I should be watching it more. Unfortunately, I'm spending the time listening to Steve Bannon and Candace Owens' podcast so I can keep oh, you guys posted on what's happening out there. That's man. Um, uh, so I'm not doing that and my, my finances are suffering. Um, so I don't know who the reporter was. Uh, David Faber, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, David asked him about Elon, about how you know he was attacking Bellingcat, which is yes. you know a investigative journalism outfit, and 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 he said they do sci and and essentially Bellingcat reported that the the killer in, in, in the Texas uh, the latest killer, yeah. as of Thursday night, yeah. Because we don't know if there'll be another one. Okay, I'm sorry. By the time this yeah. podcast airs tomorrow, yeah, Bellingcat reported this guy was. You know, essentially a white nationalist. He's Hispanic, but he's a Nazi. had white, na- yeah, he had white nationalist ideation. He had a swastika tattoo. Swastika. Yeah, yeah. and and Musk is saying that this is a psyop, that this isn't true, that like the, that his posts were on the Russian site, and and the CNBC reporter this was so ins- ill-equipped yeah. to respond to him right. that he wasn't able to be like, the guy had a fucking Nazi tattoo. Exactly. Like, are we going to split yeah. hairs here, Elon? No. Like, like God. you know. Um, we just don't know. Yeah, don't I can get you a toe but with what, paint on what, it. What um, dream? What I mean, I was listening to a clip today where he was explaining, being a billionaire, how immoral it was that some people worked from home, among yeah. many of his other. Yeah. Don't even ask. The thing, the I, thing you know, that I, for, I, yeah, the thing for me that gets it. And today he was doing this thing where he tweeted in response to. Uh, like something got deleted from the Wayback Machine, oh, yeah. the Internet Archive, right? And he tweets, uh, he's like, yeah. well, it's because Taylor Lorenz, who's this liberal reporter, yeah. like Taylor Lorenz's uncle runs the Wayback Machine, which is like not true. Like the founder of the Wayback Machine replied, and he's like, I am the founder of the Wayback Machine, and yeah. I'm not related to Taylor Lorenz. And he doesn't correct himself. So it's like, this guy isn't a white nationalist. Uh, Paul Pelosi got attacked because he had a gay lover, you know, as reported by the site that said Hillary Clinton has a body double and is an yeah. alien. And he's out there sending all this stuff while at the same time trying to argue that I want Twitter to be the place where people get real news, yeah. right? The, the journalists are the problem and Twitter is the place you get real news. But it's like, dude, you are the owner of the site, and you keep doing all these just asking questions, like tweets about total lies. And it'd be akin to if A.G. Sulzberger like, added a column yeah. on Friday to the front page of the New York Times. He's like, just asking questions. Did Bush do 9-11? <laughs> like, yeah. everybody would be like, this is insane. Like, this is insane. And he's out there doing this on what is supposed to be an information platform. And yet there is no accountability from, like, the Elon cult world, like, from the Barry Weisses and all these people. There's nobody that's like, this guy is spreading fucking bullshit left and right. So, but what about the investing community? I mean, if I I have a lot of Tesla stock and everything, I have have to be really nervous about this. Yeah, George George Soros pulled out, uh, you know, of investing from Tesla. Yeah, right, but... Yeah, you know. I mean, come on. Where are you going with that? Yeah, I'm not... You, you, Wait, you what go. Do you, what do you think they're going with? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but it was three days after that that he's tweeting that, that George Rose is an evil person. I don't oh, have yeah. the tweet in front of me, but uh, yeah. like, it's just sick. And, and and he is engaging with you know the worst like contrarian misinformation far right MAGA people you know on 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 the site and okay, elevating but I, but them. But just stress this though: it's not just 
your normal conspiracy crazies. If there's a continuum, Elon Musk is way over here. The fact that he is trying to provide disinformation about a neo-Nazi, I mean... There's some brain worms here. Do you have any yeah, insight it, no, into that? It, well, it, I, it's I can't blame problem. that on the Viagra whiskey poisoning. And no, that's, I think that's, he's been seriously right? red-pilled. And this is the concerning thing. And that thing. has real impact on our culture. It does. Yeah. This is a concerning thing. Because tying this back to our DeSantis conversation, right, was like there are a lot of people out there who are casuals. You know, they're not coming on a Thursday night to go to a nerdy podcast yeah. event at, at the yeah. Simfun space. We appreciate you. We're not casuals. But there are a lot of casuals out there, okay? And they look at the DeSantis stuff, and they're like, you're kind of weird. But they like Elon Musk, right? Like, I mean, Walter Isaacson, who I respect, is doing a bio on him. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. But it's like, he did the SpaceX thing. He did the Tesla. I like him for that reason. He's he's a troll. He's funny. I'm not into politics. And so this is why this is so dangerous, right? Like, this is a very powerful, very influential person that is sending those casuals down this dark, right. like white nationalist adjacent, maybe maybe not adjacent. Well, place. And, and, and this has been the, the scariest thing to watch is the normalization and the mainstreaming of things that have always been out there, but we're on the dark edges the and really, really right. fringe. And the role that people with the microphones played in all of that. I mean, we can focus on the actual 4chan people, but when it is the Elon Musk or even worse, at least historically, Tucker Carlson, every single night, would come on the air and would ask questions about the Great Replacement Theory. Five minutes before this, the only people who talked about the Great Replacement Theory were neo-Nazis. And suddenly it's being beamed to millions of people. Now, I would love to be able to tell you that that's why Rupert Murdoch ended up firing him. But, you know, I would love to say that it was... The disinformation, the lying about the vaccines, lying about the election, uh, the fact that he is Vladimir Putin's bitch, um, or or the overt racism, but the reality we is it was probably something else. So here's they, the, the, they, they called him a cunt. But um, well, uh, by I by think the way, there's probably do, a reason do, do, why. At some point, though, doesn't Elon Musk need to like worry about something like a Dominion lawsuit? Not against Twitter, but against himself. If he is sitting there saying these things, wait, we do have a little bit of evidence that maybe defaming people, lying about them on the air, might not work out well for you. Well, two thoughts on this. One, I do think he's going to lose, I don't know, probably 30 or $40 billion. Uh, He made one of the worst uh, financial... Thoughts and prayers. Yeah, he he made one of the worst financial decisions ever on Twitter. Um, But he's also, he was the richest man in the world. I think he's the third richest now or something. So he he can afford to lose $30 billion. I, I wish, you know, I wish that I was in that situation. I'm not... Um, so, and, and he basically admitted that on CNBC, right? He said, yeah. I'm going to say what the fuck I want if we lose money, yeah. whatever. And I, and I do think that it's going to, it's going to harm Tesla. I, I don't really care that much about Elon's financial situation though. Like the thing that I do care about to go back to your earlier point is, you know, I wrote in the, in the book, I did a book. I don't know if you guys yeah. knew that, um, about New York Times Alyssa, Alyssa Farah's dad, um, who, who, who founded World Net Daily, right? So Joe Farah. And World Net Daily has been this thing has been around for a while, right? This is yeah. what you, you describe as the fever swamps, you yeah. know, like the people down the basement. That was World Net Daily. They right. were the, uh, you yeah. know, they, they were the, all the news that's fit to print of the fever Before swamps. Before this, yes, yeah. right. Before this, right? Yeah. And, and, and it was a problem, and people that went and sought that out could find it, right? But, like, it was still kind of over there, right? right? And, and now Elon is elevating right. the modern-day World Net Dailies right. of the world to the people who... I don't really follow the news that much. And like they just get a little bit of the news. And I think that is why it is, it's such a dangerous situation. Okay. So let's talk about the hometown hero here. I understand. Right. Eric Adams? I understand that. Oh, we got two Eric Adams fans in the this crowd. Is, this, right. is no Bipartisanship. Longer, this is no longer Donald Trump's hometown. This mm. is true. Right, right. But, but he has been spending some quality time here lately. So let's talk about that. He has been indicted on, like, what, three dozen charges for paying, you know, hush money to a porn star? Feels good to come to New York and not be perp-walked when you land, doesn't it? It's like, ah, free man! And, of course, we had the lawsuit in which he was found to have have sexually assaulted a woman. Now, I I, I wrote a piece basically saying, and I'm still slightly obsessed about this, that there is literally no other area of American life where someone could 
be indicted or sexually assault someone and remain the CEO of a company, on the board of directors of a company, the coach of a professional uh, team, the owner of a team. There is nothing. You could not get a job at Burger King, um, being the manager of Burger King, with Donald Trump's record. And yet, and we continue to talk about this and will for a long time, Donald Trump has been held accountable here, or is in the process, but his poll numbers have gone up. Since he was perp walked, and even since he lost that jury verdict to, to E. Jean Carroll, his poll numbers have gone up, and his lock on the Republican Party has been stronger. Ball grab? <laughs> what is that hand gesture? When you're a podcast host, you can, <laughs> you do, can it, do it. They, they let you do it. They let, oh let, let you do any of that. Okay. He's in the ball, ball so, torture. So there, there was a little bit of a delay there. Um, <laughs> Sorry okay, about that. So, so let's talk about this, because... And again, you and, I, you and I have had hundreds of conversations. We don't usually do this where we see each other. See, I don't, we don't I'm not see used to the each hand other. gestures. No. I'm not used to the hand gestures. The Republicans <laughs> have had question? so many opportunities to take an off-ramp after he lost, after he was impeached, all of the, the yeah. times. And, and I think that people like Ron DeSantis and Glenn Youngkin have been sitting back waiting, okay, he's going to get indicted, you know, and then we will be able to move in and everything. He's indicted, he becomes stronger. So you wrote a whole book about this, but it is worth continuing to discuss. Why is the Republican Party incapable of quitting this guy? Why can they not take the yeah. off-ramp? Um, Help us understand well, the psychology. I'm, I'm going I, I, to answer the question, but I just want to start really quick with a yeah. little bit of happy news. Please. Which is his general election poll numbers haven't gone up, and he is scared not as many people as we all would wish, but like quite a few people, present company included, away from the Republican Party. And there's a reason why the Republican Party did a lot shittier in 2022 than they should have done. And it's mostly him and, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, the Supreme Court. He can win, though. Yeah, he could. She could. Sure, sure, sure. But I'm just saying that that since all the stuff you laid out, Bragg and E. Jean Carroll, et cetera, and we could go down the whole list. Uh, he, has, so that is only, yeah. It's only improved his numbers vis-a-vis DeSantis, right, in the right. primary. You know, and that's a discrete animal. And so why can these guys not get rid of them? I, I, I think the real answer is that, you know, there are two groups of people. One is there are the voters, the people, and they wanted this. They just, they wanted this all around. And it's something that I grappled with in the book in a real way, mm. which is I, I do wonder if you could rewrite history could the party elites have done a better job right. of trying to appeal to what those people really wanted, right? Yeah. Which was not globalism, which was not, you know, like we could go down all the issues, right? Like Trump did it and he was the first one to do it. And they have this cultish yeah. attraction to him now. And, and Ron DeSantis, no matter how hard he tries, no matter how yeah. mean he is to trans people, no matter what he does, he still smells like a fucking neocon. Yeah. He still smells like right. 2002, you know, Carl Rove. Okay, like he so, did, and so, so, so yeah. Trump doesn't. So he has that hold over them because of that. The rest of the folks, like, why is Chris Rossovita and my old colleague Susie Wiles, like, why are they helping him? Yeah. Stories all this time, thirst for power. You wrote about this, and, and I think the, the image that you had was that the Republican elites are not waiting to be defeated by Donald Trump. They were basically ball gagging themselves <laughs> in the basement. Was that, was, was that you, Tim? Well, it was me. Uh, the, 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 I, I, that, that evocative metaphor was brought up because... Uh, my friend Jonathan Martin um, wrote this story, and I love Jay Martin, and he's yeah. the best chronicler, because they all still yeah. talk to him. He's the best chronicler of, like, what does the Republican consulting class think? And he is doing an interview. Uh, he, was, uh, he did a column recently where one of the Republican consultants, who he said was very prominent, so I take him at his word, uh, said that he's like, you know, the, the numbers that we're looking at, it just it feels like it's going to be Trump again, and we're just yeah. going to have to go back down yeah. in the basement and ride this out. Yeah. And that is what led me to wonder, where do you think you've been the last seven years? Yeah. Like, you've been in the basement the whole fucking time, right. bro. Yeah. Like, he has you ball gag down there. And, like, that is the deal. It's like, it is the anti, and to use a poker term, is to be on board with it. And they've gotten so used to it and so comfortable with it that in spite of everything that's happened, in spite of the deaths at the Capitol, like they're still gonna, they're still gonna write it out. You broke it down in like twelve different ways of appeasing Donald yeah. Trump. I mean, you have the transactionalists, you have the professionals, yeah. you have the quasi true believers. 
it, it continues to be a remarkable thing. And I, and I know that, you know, clearly what you're seeing is that this is what the base wants. Fox News knows what their audience wants. The politicians think they know what the base wants. And yet this is the question that nags at me, and we'll never know the answer. If you did have some of the leaders of the party at that time, the pre-Trump Republican Party, if they had stood up and said, look, this is nuts, this is crazy, um, and some of them did, and they got rolled over. Yeah. Um, but there is that failure because, you know, and I'm so sick of this, the number of Republicans that we know that will say in private, well, yeah, we know this, we listen to the bulwark, yeah. but, but if I did this, I would lose my primary. Um, and I think people need to understand that when we talk about tribal politics, it's not just politics. I mean, this is, this is people's, their communities, the clubs they belong to, their coworkers, their family members, and you either belong or you don't belong. Yeah. And one of the things that, that Tim and I have experienced is that feeling of excommunication, where it's, it feels uh, great, actually, being um, excommunicated. Well, no, well, I don't know does. if you've ever been excommunicated for anything, but it feels I, nice. I, I, don't, I don't disagree, but I mean, understand when you lose you know, you, all of your professional uh, associates, but also many friends, people you've known for years. And I have to say, one of the big shocks for us has been people we've known for 20 years. And I hear you just describe it just last week. You said, I can't believe I saw that person doing this sort of yeah. thing. And it continues to be a, a, a shock. And so there is that alienation. But you're also right. There is also a liberation. When you step out and realize how much of our politics is that if you're on Team A, you must agree with everything that Team A does. If you're on Team B, you must defend everything that Team B does. That after a while, that becomes a habit. But when you step outside, it is incredibly liberating and incredibly refreshing. And I think that that's what we've tried to do with the bulwark. I think that that's what, what has bonded us together is that we're all people that kind of stepped out of the cave and looked around and said, hey, this is actually kind of nice out here. It does feel nice, yeah. doesn't it? Thank you all for coming. It all does right, feel, what, one, one just last... Really, just really quick on this, though. The yeah. book, spoiler alert, the book ends with, with uh, uh, the book, the, the editor, the publisher, who I just met with earlier. I don't have a good idea for a second book, so if any of you guys have a good idea, please let me know. Yeah. But I just met with him. He wanted me to do a positive end. Like, here's yeah. how we get out of this. And the and book actually ends with, you know, it looks like this road that we're on goes on forever. And, and, and the reason why is because the people that made those decisions, made those rationalizations, right. like those rationalizations are still operative. Just because Ashley Babbitt's right. dead or just because, right. you know, some cops right. got it, like their rationalizations, whatever yeah. they were, the different categories, whatever they were, they're still operative. And, uh, and for us, you know, we just keep getting freer and freer, yeah. right? Because everything that happens right. like proves us more and more right, which is really nice. Um, and every once in a while, we'll, get, we'll, we'll pull over one or two more people, yeah, you know, fall right, across right, the line. Right. But, like, the rest of their rationalizations continue yeah. as such. And, and I think that, like, is why in, in uh, one of the books I was reading recently, it was this analogy with the devil. And it's like the, the, when you make the deal with the devil, like, the, the devil just keeps raising the ante. Right. You know, he doesn't let you off the hook, right? right? And, and you, you get and, a lot and of the, the good stuff, going to keep right? getting raised. That's right. And, and I think that they've, they've lived through that. And by the way, we agree with you that it goes on and on. Now, I was not told there would be arithmetic tonight. So how many years ago thing? was 1968? This audience? Oh, God, don't go try on. to age no? us. Okay. Now, think about the impact, 55 years. Think about the impact that the politics of 1968 had on the decades that came after, how we're still kind of living in the hangover of what happened in 1968. And if you realize that you think 55 years from now, sorry. I'm sorry, that, because I think there are a lot of people that are coming into politics now, they're looking around, they're looking at Elon Musk's Wait, Twitter. And so how much this, older this are you than me? Sense. I'm trying to figure out how uh, long way, 55 way. years from now Ma is gonna be. Mar Mar they, they see Marjorie Taylor Greene and they go, that's what a politician's supposed to do. So Tim, one last time, okay? Yeah that we had to have a bonding thing here? Okay, because I have one more tune for you. It's not, it's not oh, a show tune. No. But Tim will get this one, okay? LCD okay. sound system. Last one. New York, I love you. Oh, we do like this one. Hey. Thank you all so much. We love Billie Eilish. You've been listening to last night's live event in New York City. Thank you all for listening to this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday. 
in our regular venue, and we'll do this all over again.